And I have, and I have to tell you, I am really saddened by the fact that this is our last uh, webinar. And Loretta, I'm going to give you a uh, important uh, job today. Uh, when there's 10 minutes left, uh, would you come on and say, Anita, there's 10 minutes left, and I'm going to do questions that they might have at that time over anything we've done. Okay, thank you. Excellent. So last time we focused on uh, what research would advise us in order to increase uh, narrative comprehension, which we learned that the major strategy uh, in narrative is story grammar, which all of you knew very well. Uh, and we would apply that to the questions we ask, uh, to the summaries that we wrote, uh, so the retells that students did. Uh, and today we're going to look at informative or informational text. Both terms are utilized. Uh, and if you are a primary teacher in kindergarten, first or second grade, or even in preschool, uh, think about this as what you might do to increase comprehension when you're doing a informative read aloud. Because the research would suggest that if you want to increase uh, vocabulary and comprehension, that not doing all narrative read-alouds in the primary grades, but at least half of them being informative text. So think about it in terms of listening comprehension. In third, fourth, and fifth grade, yes, you might read informational text to students that is above their reading level, uh, and you'd apply it then uh, through listening comprehension, but you'll also be reading uh, no matter which different core reading program you have or science or social studies, you can apply this there. And I'd like you to have sort of like two hats on. One hat uh, to look at your own practice and what you could do to increase the probability students would have better comprehension because they had you as a fourth grade teacher or as a second grade teacher or as a fifth grade teacher. Uh, and also, in terms of your curriculum, are there things in the curriculum that need to bring, uh, be brought up so that they're in concert with what we know from research? All right, so let, we have lots to cover, uh, and you're going to participate. Sometimes I'm going to ask you to make short responses, but because we can't sync our voices, uh, remain uh, muted. Sometimes we are going to read things together, muted. Sometimes we are going to do close reading, but muted. But also, uh, I'm going to teach some lessons and you're going to be my students so I can demonstrate um, these practices uh, that you could have as an immediate takeaway. All right. And so let's first start with what we know about both informative comprehension and narrative comprehension. And uh, there you are. And we started with the model, and we're going to continue with this model, that comprehension uh, is an outcome. It is an outcome of everything that we would do in reading. Uh, and if we want students to comprehend, they have to be able to read, read it with me, read the words accurately and fluently. So I'm going to again remind our kindergarten, first and second grade teachers that your most critical content, uh, contribution to comprehension uh, is ensuring that the students can read accurately and fluently, that your major contribution uh, is can they read accurately and fluently, thus teaching of decoding, uh, teaching uh, letter sound associations uh, remains uh, the most critical curriculum area you have in terms of reading comprehension. But you also have to understand the meanings of words. Uh, and so uh, we would be teaching vocabulary throughout all the grades and all the domains uh, and utilizing our highest vocabulary with students uh, to increase the vocabulary of those students. And they need background knowledge. That's why we start reading informational texts back in kindergarten. So the students are gaining knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge. And through our reading programs, they're gaining more knowledge because you are comprehending something, reading something, 
and your comprehension is going to relate to how can you connect it to what you've already been taught, what you already know, which will help your retention of that information. And uh, this one is the one we're really going to focus on today, and that is uh, that you have to attend to the content. You have to attend to the content. Uh, one of my mottos to remind us of this is what you think about is what you learn. What you think about is what you learn. So I need all of my cognitive energy, all of my thinking in the text, thinking about it. And we looked at three different ways in narrative to do that. One, we could ask students questions, uh, which would get them focused on the content. We could also uh, have the students generate questions to keep them focused on the content. We could also teach strategies um, that keep them focused on the content. Uh, and uh, so this is a really critical thing that we do. So, and we could also use the structure of the text. So we're going to uh, look at the same concept that we looked at last time, focus attention on critical content, but we're going to do it with informational text in mind. Now, uh, we looked at taking that background knowledge and putting it into sort of an actionable form. And that is what we might do before we read a passage to students or the students read it, what we might do during and what we might do afterwards. So let's just review because the same structure that we use for narrative text, we're gonna use this time for informational text. So there were three things that we know make a difference before students read text that increases their comprehension. So put up three fingers, touch your fingers and see if you can recall what those three things were. See if you had them uh, teach the pronunciation of unfamiliar words so that they can read more accurately the material teach the uh, vocabulary terms critical for that material. Uh, and number three uh, was to give them, yes, background knowledge. Okay, say them to yourself again. Pronunciation, meaning, background knowledge. I'm doing this again to model what you could do in your classroom to get students to truly think about it by actually rehearsing the information. All right, so we know what to do before uh, that makes a difference, and we know what makes a difference during. Uh, we do know one thing that it's helpful often for them to read it more than one time, uh, particularly if we go back and do close reading of a portion, uh, they might read it uh, silently and then read it chorally, uh, because if we read three things, again, we have better comprehension. Uh, and we also looked at a strategy, an overarching strategy, when we're reading text, uh, read, stop, respond. Uh, say that again, read, stop, respond. We're going to read a segment, we're going to stop, and then we're going to respond. Maybe we're going to respond by answering a question from the teacher. Maybe we're going to respond because uh, we, as students, are going to write down a question and the answer. Uh, maybe we are going to stop and take notes on what we've written. May so read, stop, respond. Now, there were a number of things, uh, bodies of research that we can draw from when the students are reading that we're going to uh, repeat from last time. We could ask them text dependent, what everyone, questions. Uh, we could teach them some strategies, uh, and we could focus on the structure of the text. As I read the research, and the first book on your reading list would be the one that I'd get on comprehension, if you wanted one great book on the research and practice to improve comprehension, that's it. Uh, ask questions, use a strategy, 
or attend to the text structure. Uh, and then we looked at what you could do afterwards. And there's two things that emerge consistently. And so putting up your two fingers, if you remember what kind of activities afterwards would improve comprehension of that passage, but also would teach skills that would generalize to other uh, passages. Okay, I bet you said uh, we'd have a discussion if it's done well. We'll review what makes it done well. Uh, or we could have the students write in response. So we're just going to take that same model before, during, and after and apply it to informational text. So let's start out with the first part, which is before. Uh, and uh, let me just make a little adaption on it. There we go. Uh, and so you remember before we're going to teach the pronunciation of words. Uh, and we're going to introduce critical vocabulary, and we're going to introduce background knowledge. Now, all of our examples uh, that are used today are ones that uh, I have either designed for training in different states, different cities, uh, or uh, directly taught to students. So there's lots of different informational examples. And uh, I was in a school district that was utilizing wonders, and they had uh, passage books that the students would practice. Uh, and this one was all on archaeology uh, and had different chapters about uh, uh, digs, etc. And I was to read the ancient one. So I did what you would do is I read it beforehand. Uh, if I'm going to be a good language arts teacher, I had better be really familiar with the passages. So I read the passage, and as I read it, I asked myself, what are the difficult to pronounce words? What words need meaning directly taught that's not supported by context clues, uh, but was needed for comprehension? And what background knowledge given beforehand would give the students sort of a mental map uh, to connect it to? Uh, so I asked myself those questions, uh, and here is what emerged. First, I said, what words uh, might be difficult for them to pronounce? Uh, and uh, so there were some words, archaeology, archaeologist, artifact, and excavate, that I said, I'm going to teach the meaning of those words. Uh, and so why don't I simply work on the pronunciation as I introduce the meaning? Uh, and, but then there were other words, and the students were really working on reading multisyllabic words. Uh, and so I went through and wrote down multisyllabic words that we could practice reading. Now, why is this important? Because when we get up into the upper grades, third, fourth, and fifth grade, most core programs assume that any of these words the students could read with automaticity. And that simply is not the truth that sprinkled in your third, fourth, and fifth grade chief class, or the majority, are students that would not be able to attack descendant and emerge with a word. Uh, so they need some scaffolding. And most of the words that they have trouble with are multisyllabic words. Uh, and what we would do is simply break them down into the parts. Now, here, I broke them formally down into the parts, but it would be better for me not to uh, separate uh, these syllables and have it in a word. So let's say that it was on the board, and I put my finger here, and I went under it and said, what part? And they said D. And the next part's tricky, so I would say the next part is send. What part? Send. Next part is ant. D, send, ant. But what we say is descendant. Say the word three times. Descendant, descendant, descendant. Uh, looking at the next word. Uh, what part? Trad. Say the sound. I. And say the suffix. Shun. Trad, I, shun. What we say is tradition. Say it. Tradition. 
So I'm going to guide the students part by part. There's two outcomes. I am strengthening uh, their ability to read the passage, but I'm also strengthening their ability to attack multisyllabic words found in third, fourth, and fifth grade. All right, but this means I've had to intentionally read the material beforehand and pluck this out. And then I'm going to teach vocabulary. Uh, and let me just cover that up because we spent some time on vocabulary. Uh, and there were four steps in the model I gave you, which is very similar to the model that was embedded in all of your core programs. Uh, for example, first would be uh, sharing with the students the pronunciation of the word and practicing the pronunciation. Okay, see if you can remember the other parts, put your four fingers up and give it a try. Okay, so what was it? I'm gonna introduce the pronunciation. I'm gonna introduce the words meaning. I'm going to give some examples and I'm going to check your understanding. Okay, so with that, uh, saying them again with me, first I'm going to uh, introduce the pronunciation, then I'm going to introduce the meaning, and then I am going to give some examples, and then I'm going to ask questions to check their understanding. Teacher talk. I'm trying to remind us that if I am teaching something and I want students to learn it, they've got to rehearse it in order to learn it. We just tend to whip through things thinking just one exposure is going to do it. And I can tell you, not true. So I just wanted to embed that reminder uh, in this lesson, the importance of rehearsal. Okay, so the day I taught it, uh, this was actually uh, the way I laid it out. Uh, and I trained teachers. We had a little chart uh, that had these written in it and we filled this in. What was the word? Uh, what was the meaning we were gonna use? What were some examples we're gonna use? Uh, and how are we gonna check their understanding, which we checked with examples and non-examples. And we did the same thing uh, with the next word, uh, preserve. So be my students. This word is preserve, preserve. What is it? Preserve. Uh, and if we look at the parts, uh, we're going to do this before we serve something. We preserve it. And read the definition with me. When you preserve something, you protect it so it will last. One more time. When you preserve something, you protect it so it will last. And then we gave some examples. Now, since this is about archeology span and museums, we better give an example that would tie to that. Uh, so I'm gonna read when I stop, say the next word. A museum will preserve a delicate piece of ancient pottery by putting it in a glass container. They do this because they want the ancient pottery to last. And I'm gonna read, when I stop, you say the next word, to preserve vegetables a little longer. We put them in the refrigerator and they preserve it. Uh, now, preserve was particularly used uh, as a word with food. And it means, if we look at the morphographs in the word, uh, pre is before and serve is to serve it. So before we serve it, uh, we do something to make it last, like put the vegetables in the refrigerator. Teacher talk. Teaching the kids in this way gets them kind of interested. I bet you never thought that preserve was pre-serve. So, uh, and then we're going to check their understanding. 
Uh, and so you're going to put your finger up if it is preserved and you're going to go down uh, if it is not preserved. You pressed a flower and put it in an envelope. If it is preserved, thumbs up. If it's not, thumbs down. Okay, and I might even stop and say, if we were in a classroom, tell your partner why that's an example of preserve. Because uh, it is an example of preserve because uh, you want the flower to last. So you pressed it and put it in an envelope. Okay, get ready with the next. You throw away a flower. Uh, show me if that's preserve. No, it's not preserve. Tell your partner why it is not preserve. Because you did nothing. It's not preserve. Give them a sentence starter. It's not preserved because you did nothing to make the flower last. All right. So all the work we did on vocabulary can be infused right in here uh, to teaching select words beforehand. And now we're going to read the passage. Uh, and one of the things that we know is that uh, repeated readings definitely improves comprehension. I mean, if you're going to get your kids ready for the state test, teach them to read the passages more than one time because it will improve their comprehension. Don't race through that test, uh, but uh, read it more than one time to ensure better comprehension. Uh, and uh, if you're in the classroom, you as a teacher are going to take the passage and you're going to put it into appropriate segments to read. And we're going to read one segment. We're going to stop and have them respond. We're going to read a segment, stop and have them respond. Now, it was harder with narrative because you want meaningful places to stop. Uh, were natural junctures in the story. Uh, and the segments actually in narrative often differ quite a bit by length because there might be uh, two pages that set up the setting. And so you want to go through that, stop after uh, they've introduced the setting and ask questions to firm up that information. Then we read on. In informational text, it's much easier because it's either going to we read a paragraph, stop and respond. We read a paragraph, we stop and respond. Or we read related paragraphs, stop and respond. So, because every paragraph in informational text is a mini body of knowledge. So, one of the reasons we ask questions is to ensure kids are thinking about the most critical information. And so we stop and ask those questions at natural junctures in the informative text. And then, yes, we ask questions uh, as one of the ways to get them honed in on content, but we've got to have those text-dependent questions that keep you in the text, not out of the text. In the text, not out of the text. And uh, there are some strategies that have very good research. And I'm going to share with you the one that has the most compelling research called paragraph shrinking. If you did nothing more with informational text, then use paragraph shrinking. Wow, wow, wow. You can't believe what a difference it makes in comprehension. So that is our must do uh, because of the compelling research. And we could also focus on the text structure. Now, in narrative, it was focusing on the structure that was uh, created by um, the structure of at the beginning, middle, and end. That's one structure. Uh, or the features, which were all of the story grammar features. In informative text, uh, it is things such as topic and details, uh, sequence, uh, compare and contrast, uh, what is um, the compare and contrast, the problem and solution, those kind of structures. You can see we have lots to cover. All right. So I was asked in an email, how might you actually read it? Because I didn't do that in our last webinar. So thank you for the question. Uh, and we're going to divide it into meaningful segments. 
And how we proceed in reading it with our class is very dependent on the grade level. Um, of course, if I'm reading it to them in a read aloud, I have it still in natural segments, but I'm reading it to them. But what if uh, we're reading it? Well, this is the most common way I do it, uh, is on the first read, uh, I have the students read silently. And actually, uh, most often I ask them to whisper read, particularly in third and fourth grade, uh, because we have very good emerging research that orally reading is very beneficial to students, even through high school, uh, that having some of the reading that we do orally, where we're getting that auditory feedback. Have you ever noticed when you're reading something and don't quite comprehend it, that you then you start reading it out loud? I know that I just was doing my trust uh, and I kept reading it uh, and reading it out loud uh, because I really wanted to be able to understand all of it. And uh, if the, I teach students that they're reading a segment and I tell them what the segment is and when they get to the end, they're to go back and reread it. Now, uh, the reason I do this uh, is that some students read more fluently than others, so they're going to finish up before others. Uh, and then we have voids in the lesson, and we know that they will fill the voids. Don't forget Archer's, one of her uh, management mottos is avoid the void, for they will fill it. Now, I visited one teacher virtually, and she was in her class, but I was in Portland. And she was on the East Coast, and I'm on the West Coast. But when she taught, she said to the students, read down uh, to the paragraph. Uh, when you finish, put your thumb up, but go back and read it again. Oh, that was so smart because the teacher got the indication they were done, but the kids had to go back and reread so there wouldn't be any void. Uh, now, here's what the teacher should do. Even if I'm a fifth grade teacher, I should try to hear individual students read. And so while they are whisper reading or they are silently reading, I'm gonna be circulating around the room, listening to individuals read. And when I come to their uh, desk, and I usually recommend that you be side by side when you are monitoring, and I will just whisper to the child, please, uh, whisper read uh, to me loud enough that I can hear you. Uh, and I'll thank that child, and then I'll move to another child. Uh, but this is our opportunity to monitor individual students without calling them out and having them read from the whole class. Because then when I call on one student to read, only one student's practicing reading, and it could be one of their worst moments. Maybe they're shy, maybe they're a poor reader, uh, but reading in front of the classroom could be devastating. But I still need to hear them read and I could do it when they're reading on their own. And then we uh, would orally read that segment. Uh, we could read it together, chorally. We could use closed reading. I read, stop, and you say the next word. Uh, I could have them reread that segment to their partner. Uh, if I wanted to call on individuals, uh, well, first of all, I would use what I also use with partners. And this is a really useful thing. So listen carefully, particularly third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers. When they work with partners, I say, when it's your turn to read, maybe you're a one, maybe you're a two, and it's your turn to read, you have this option. You can say me or we to your partner. If you say we, you've just invited your partner to read it with you. So a safety net for the lower readers. They can always say we, and their partner will read it with them and scaffold their reading. And today, if I was in your classroom and was gonna call on an individual, I would also let them have the me or we option. So if they said we, the whole class is going to read with them. Uh, and so the angst, many of us had angst, even we remember it as kids uh, when the teacher called on us. All right, that was in response to an email. Thank you very much. Well, uh, 
what are the ways that we could read it that would keep their attention on the content? We could ask questions. And last time we met, I said, if you're going to ask questions, always ask yourself this, what is the most important understanding? What is the most important understanding in this segment? What is the most important understanding? And ask that question. Uh, because, uh, you know, we now know that we used to have a list of kinds of questions we could ask. Uh, and so we try to get them all in as if that would help the kids. But what helps the most is getting them to hone in on the most important understanding. So we ask text-dependent questions, uh, and you all know what those are. They're questions where the answers are going to be uh, directly related to what they read in the text, because we want to keep the students in the text, not out of the text. Get your hand ready, everybody in the text, not out of the text. I don't see everybody's hands in the text, not out of the text, in the text, not out of the text. So just this morning, when I was on a website uh, in Nebraska, uh, we had this question because a teacher uh, was asking questions such as, uh, did you have this experience as they read? Well, now that took everybody's cognition out of the text. Uh, and it reduces the amount of learning that they had in the text. And I suggested to that teacher, just as I suggested to you last time, is those questions that desire to connect the student's own personal experience to the text should not be asked while we're reading it, but should be asked before or after, not during. Okay, so this is the article that I recently was reading with students, uh, and it happened to be about canoes, uh, Native American canoes made from uh, logs, Native American clues that were uh, made from the birch bark that was removed from trees and then sewn together in strips, cool. Uh, and compared them to the kind of canoes that people today might have. Uh, so it's actually a, a perfect um, passage to work on uh, text-dependent questions. So I had to read this section. Well, first of all, it was easy to divide into sections because like most informational text, each paragraph was a body of knowledge. So I wanted to read stop and respond, read, stop and respond, read, stop and respond. So uh, I had to think about the questions beforehand. Now, if the students have, for informational text, have a copy that they can write in, uh, then I might even have them uh, do annotations such as underline the critical content. Uh, so, uh, everybody, reading uh, this to yourself. If you get down here, go back and read it again until I say stop. So I had them read it, and then we read it uh, together. Uh, and so follow the cursor uh, and read it with me and go. A canoe is a long, narrow boat that does not have a motor or a sail. Teach or talk. The most important thing to do if you're doing choral reading is to not go too fast. I see too many teachers and myself doing this. A canoe is a long, narrow boat that does not have a motor or a sail. Uh, and it needs to be a moderate rate. Now, we could have read it using the close procedure. This would be a non-example. When I stop, say the next word. 
several people can sit in most canoes. Okay, not the best idea. Better something like this. Several people can sit in most canoes. You want to uh, have the students say the most important words that create meaning. If you happen to have two words that go together, like a narrow boat, uh, this would not be good. A canoe is a long, narrow boat. No, a canoe is a long, narrow boat. You should uh, have the students say the last part, the last word uh, in the series of words, if it is uh, more than one word. So we would read it again. And I said, uh, here's your question. You're going to describe a canoe. And read the sentence starter, a canoe is. But first, would you go through and underline the words that would describe, that would describe uh, a canoe? So the students went through and underlined words. Uh, one student underlined long narrow boat that has paddles and it moves through the water. And then uh, they had to say, uh, practice to themselves, uh, a canoe is a long narrow boat that moves through the water with paddles. In this case, I then had them say it to their partner. Uh, and this was one child's response. A canoe is a long, narrow boat that moves through water when people paddle. But notice I had them prepare by saying it to themselves, not just think about it, but practice it before they shared it with their partner. You cannot believe how much better your responses will be if you give them time, not just to think, but to actually prepare. And as I've told you before, I'm now having kids put their hand over their mask and talking to their mask. When their masks are gone, I'm going to do the same thing, talking to your hand. Uh, and then they shared with a partner and I called on two students. Um, so we went to the next part. We read it silently. We read it orally. Uh, I gave them a question. What were Native American canoes made from? Uh, I again had them underline the critical information to answer their question. Uh, and then I had them prepare their answer. Native American canoes are made from uh, birch bark and logs. Then they said it to their partner and then I called on a student. Uh, and we read the paragraph again silently or whisper read it, then orally. Uh, and then I asked the question. In this case, I had them retell it by numbering, uh, because they could write on it, uh, numbering the segments. Uh, and so that then they would practice saying, first they did this, then they did this, then they did this. And the same thing for the next paragraph, because it also had a sequence in it. Uh, and we wrapped it up uh, with this question. How are canoes today different from Native American canoes? Well, remember last time when I suggested that we might ask literal questions before we ask a higher order question. So I asked scaffolding questions. How did Native Americans use their canoes? How do people today use their canoes? Uh, what materials did Native Americans use to make canoes? What materials are used today to make canoes? And so then they could answer this question, how are canoes today different from Native American canoes? Their canoes were dug out or made of uh, material that was stripped from trees. Today it's made out of metal. Uh, then they used it uh, to travel from place to place, to trade from place to place. Um, and, but today we mostly use it for fun and recreation. So again, asking the question, what is the most important understanding? Well, we can ask questions. Read, stop, respond. We could also teach students to generate their own questions. Now, I went to uh, two major studies on how to teach kids to generate questions. 
And one study was done with second and third graders, uh, which taught uh, how to ask questions using each of the questioning words, like who, uh, teaching them how to ask who questions uh, and what questions and where questions and when questions and how questions uh, and why questions, you know those. Uh, but they taught them one at a time, and then the students uh, generated uh, with any of the words, but they had to teach them. Um, so um, with the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So if you're a third grade teacher, this would be a very good thing to teach your students in, uh, over time with whatever content you're reading, because it could be taught with narrative or informative text. So the day I taught it, uh, we had articles about Thomas Edison. And I started with teaching them who questions only. So we read this and then I uh, showed them. Uh, so I could start a question with who. So I might ask this question, who invented the electric light? Who invented electric light? Say my question, who invented electric light? And the answer was Thomas Alva Edison. Good. So we went through uh, many paragraphs and came up with who questions. Like who taught uh, Edison, Thomas Edison? Because he only went a few years to school. And it was his mother. Uh, and who started experimenting with uh, science very, very early in his life, Thomas Edison. So we practiced with who. And then we happened that next day to use the same paragraphs and I taught them what. Uh, again, I do it. Uh, we do it together, scaffold and help. And then we practiced it with them. Now, if you are a fourth or fifth grade teacher, you might want to utilize from a different study uh, this practice. After um, when we got to a certain segment that was read, we'd stop and the students would have to generate questions and answers. So they would, instead of me asking them questions, we're going to stop and they are going to generate one or two questions about that segment and the answer. So, uh, if I had done the same passage on canoes, uh, it would look like this. So, we read the first paragraph and the students write down uh, a question. Uh, what does a canoe look like? And the answer. Uh, and then we read the next segment uh, and they write down what were Native American canoes made from. Uh, and now this takes a good deal of modeling, but think about how useful it would be if the students got very good at coming up with the big idea questions and the answers. Uh, so uh, I have taught this before, so I included uh, the success criteria that we used on the days I taught that uh, because each question had to focus on critical content. Uh, and when they wrote the question, it had to have a capital and a question and correct spelling. And it had to make sense, make sense, make sense. Everything has to make sense. And then their answer had to be an accurate and complete answer. And it had to use words from the question. Uh, and they had to have complete sentences and had to make sense. It had to have a capital letter, a period, appropriate spelling and legible handwriting. So couldn't you see teaching kids to do that with informational text? What a great preparation uh, for even independent study. I read a section, I stop, uh, I write down a question on one side of the paper uh, and I write the answer on the other side. In fact, we usually had the students uh, have their paper folded first and they would write the question and the answer. Now, I will tell you though, we have not taught our students well how to study. And the original curriculums I wrote were on study skills. 
And this is a strategy we found most effective. Uh, if they had questions and answers, we first had them read the question and the answer. Then we had them cover up the answer uh, and recite the answer and then open it up and check. Uh, then they would read the next question, the next answer. They would recite it without looking at it. And then they would check their answer. Read, cover, recite, check. I highly recommend this strategy to you because if I am a seventh grader and I've taken notes in a class, I could read the topic and the details. I could cover it up with my hand. I could recite it out loud. If I'm a 10th grader and want to remember uh, the phone number of my new girlfriend, I could write it down. I could read it one time, two time, three time, four, cover it up, recite it out loud, lift my inner check. Or I could put it in my addresses and just recover it quickly. Uh, but if I'm learning a poem in class, I could read a verse, uh, read it twice. I could cover up that verse. I could recite it out loud. I could check, oh, not done. I have to read it again and again, cover it up again. So a strategy that's totally generalizable to other situations. Okay, teacher could ask questions. We could also teach students how to generate questions. And I gave you two methods that you could pick which one would be useful uh, to your students. But I will tell you, any strategy that you pick must be used again and again and again to really improve comprehension so that it becomes automatic and the students are really focused on the content using the strategy. That's its purpose. Whether uh, they are generating questions using uh, who, uh, what, when, where, or they're coming up with what's the most important question I could ask and what's the answer and how do I study it. Very intentional preparation for later schooling. Okay, I love this one enough to have it three times. Uh, I told you there was one strategy that I didn't want you to miss, and that is paragraph shrinking. Uh, and uh, for a strategy that was originally researched by Lynn and Doug Fuchs uh, and Pat Mathis, and then was uh, redone uh, into getting the gist. That was a new title for it, slightly altered for older students in middle school and high school uh, by Sharon Vaughn's research group. So let us look at that. And Loretta, since I don't have a clock right in front of me, tell me how much time do I have left? You have uh, 35 minutes. 35 minutes, okay. All right, well, we have a lot to cover, but you're the gifted group, uh, so we can cover it. Paragraph shrinking. So here is the strategy. Uh, students read a paragraph. So that's why this is best utilized with informational text. They read a paragraph uh, and they stop and the teacher says, name the who or what. Uh, and if they have partners, uh, they might say it to their partner. Uh, then the teacher says, tell the most important thing about the who or what. Uh, and they do that. Then the shrinking comes in say the main idea in 10 words or less. Some of you may already be familiar with this strategy, but it is one of the most powerful ones, particularly if it's employed with informational text. And the purpose is it to be teacher guided. Let's read a paragraph together. Let's stop. Uh, now ones, tell your partner who or what this is about, and then you give feedback on it. Now twos, tell your partner the most important thing about the who or what, and you give feedback on it. Uh, now one, say it to your partner in 10 words or less, and twos, count the number of words and tell them if they go over 10. And they might even stop and write it down. So they end up with a uh, main idea uh, sentence. 
Okay, but then if you have done it, let's have fifth graders and we have done this uh, in January and February and March, but in April, we might switch uh, and they might do it with their partner. So you, they would have, uh, both partners would have a copy of this uh, and they'd read a paragraph together, stop, and one student would be the teacher and say, name the whole one, tell the most important thing, uh, say it in 10 words or less. And then they might write it down and then they switch roles. So it's meant to go from teacher directed to partner strategy to uh, the next point is using it when I read myself. So I am reading an informational article and I stop after the paragraph and I say uh, who or what, this is about uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, tell the most important thing about the who or what. Uh, he invented many things in addition to electricity. Say the main idea in 10 words or less. I've got to put that together. Um, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson um, invented many things, including electric electricity and electricity light. Ooh, less than 10 words. So it can go from teacher directed to partner directed to individual study. That's how useful it is. Okay, so, but you gotta teach it to kids. Uh, and so like any other strategy you teach, you have to model it. You have to show them how to do it and tell them how to do it. Uh, and get some responses from them. So you have to have dynamic modeling. So be my students and read the title with me and uh, begin The Coldest Continent. And would you please read it with me and follow the cursor and go. Antarctica is not like any other continent. It is as far south as you can go on earth. The South Pole is found there. Ice covers the whole land. In some places, the ice is almost three miles thick. Beneath the ice are mountains and valleys. Uh, and so students, the next, the first step in the strategy, which you've already gone over it is, read it, name the who or what, the main person, animal, or thing. My turn. So this paragraph talks about the South Pole, but the whole paragraph is not about the South Pole. Three sentences talk about ice, but the whole paragraph is not about ice. Uh, the whole paragraph is about the continent of Antarctica. So I say to myself, ah, Name the four what it's about. Yes, Antarctica. Then I have to, and read it with me, tell the most important thing or things about the who or what. So I say to myself, uh, what did it tell me that was important about Antarctica that I'd want to remember? Well, here's one thing I'd want to remember. It's location. So it is the most southern uh, of all of the continents. So as far south as you can go on the earth. And usually we only uh, look for details with words or phrases, but I'm gonna actually use a sentence here uh, and read it with me. Ice covers the whole land. Now, I have to say that main idea in 10 words or less. So you're gonna count. And if I go over 10 words, you're gonna say, shrink it, okay? Let's see. Antarctica, it's a good start. Antarctica is the most Southern of all the continents and is covered in ice. Yeah, shrink it, yes, okay. Uh -huh. Antarctica. Comma. You don't have to count the commas. The most southern continent 
comma, is covered in ice. Yay! So you give a dynamic model. You might have to model it more than one time. Uh, and definitely you will. Uh, and then you are going to uh, guide the students on it. So you say, what's the first step? And then you have them do it. What's the second step? And then you have them do it. Uh, in fact, you probably would find guiding them through it uh, is going to be something that takes many days, many weeks to get them really good at this. But you can see the power of this consistency of name the who or what, tell the most important thing, uh, and uh, say it in 10 words or less. Let's do the we do it. So the first part is to name the who or what. Uh, first of all, let's read it and read it with me. The climate in Antarctica is harsh. It is the coldest place on earth. The temperature does not get above freezing. It is the windiest place in the world. So I say to the students, first we have to figure out uh, the name, name, the who or what, the main person, animal or thing. So I'd have the students think about it uh, and then suggest it to their partner. And then I'd call on them. And inevitably one child would say, well, it's still about Antarctica. Yes, that would work. Another child might say it is the climate, about climate, but only in Antarctica. And so we might conclude that uh, it is about the climate in Antarctica. And then we go back to the strategy, read number two, tell the most important thing about the who or what. And so they can pick one or two things uh, to tell about it. That day I taught it. One child said that it is uh, the coldest place uh, on earth. And it is also the windiest place. And so then they had to say this in 10 words or less. Now, the researchers gave us a little wiggle room because if, the, if you had a name the who or what, the who or what was more than one word, you could count it as one word. So that gave them a little bit of breath in terms of saying their sentence. So they had to think of it, uh, how they would put it together. So they had to say it to their partner. Uh, and one of the students said, uh, the climate in Antarctica is harsh, being the coldest and the windiest place on earth. And so I said, well, let's count it. The, the climate in Antarctica um, is the, uh, it, the climate in Antarctica is extremely cold and extremely windy. The kid said, yes, that would do it. So we practice a lot of we do it. And then they got really good at it. Then we had them uh, do it. So think about this. Uh, I would suggest you could do it with read alouds as we've done at the, at the younger grades, but we don't have them do the last one. We just have them, who or what is it about? And what's the most important thing we learned about it? Uh, so the first two steps we've used with read alouds. K. When I look at your curriculum materials, one of the things that they uh, attempt to teach are inferences. Uh, and you constantly are making inferences as you read. In fact, it's, you should just sit down and do this. Take anything that you're reading uh, and as you're reading along, mark it when the author expected that you would fill in the gap of missing information. You will be amazed how much is expected from the author to the reader uh, that they're going to have to infer. So I went to look for a strategy that could be consistently used to teach kids how to figure out inferences. And the strategy that I found to be most useful was by Beer, it says, I say, and so. And they used a graphic organizer to teach it. 
So uh, here they had an article on fire, fires in the Black Hills. And this was a question, why are forest fires on the increase uh, in the Black Hills of South Dakota? And the article said that they had had low precipitation uh, and decreased snowfall for the last several years. And I say when there's less snowfall, it could mean very dry conditions through the Black Hills. And so the very dry conditions resulting from a decrease in precipitation led to conditions that might make fires more likely to occur. It says, I say, and so. It says, I say, and so. Now, because of our limited time, I gave you two recent examples uh, where I use this, and they can you can look through them to be edified. Uh, this was a paragraph that we read, read, stop, respond. And I asked them a question that was literal. And then I asked them a question for which they're going to have to make an inference. So I used this to teach them, what does it say? What do you say? And put it together with, and so. It says, I say, and so. This was just another example from that day uh, where we had to make an inference. So I utilized exactly what they were reading to teach them this strategy. But the visual definitely helped. Question, it says, I say, and so. So here are two strategies that you could employ. Paragraph shrinking, the best, uh, and the inference strategy. But the inference strategy is more to do with your background knowledge uh, than a strategy. The more background knowledge you have, the more constant, constant uh, inferences you could make. Really, you want to entertain yourself, take out whatever book you're currently reading, have a pencil in your hand, and read along and stop and say, oh, the author expected me to know that that is Asia as a continent. Oh, the author expected me to know uh, that Russia is uh, mostly in Asia. Ah, the author expected me to know that they do not have a democracy. Oh, the author expected me to know. It's amazing uh, how much background knowledge is necessary for making all the inferences expected by authors. Well, the last one that we're going to look at, and I want to be certain that because I've switched this. Uh, Loretta, would you give me a thumbs up if you can still see the PowerPoint? Excellent. Okay, so we had one major structure uh, in, narrative, actually two. One was uh, beginning, middle, and end, and the other was all the elements of uh, story grammar. But in informational text, here's the possibilities. Most common, one that I most often used, and that's what's used in paragraph shrinking, is that every paragraph has a topic and related details. Topic, details, topic, details. Uh, and so that's usually the overarching structure of informational text. But embedded in it might be an explanation, might be a sequence, might be compare and contrast, might be cause and effect, might be problem and solution. So a good deal of recent research has looked at, if I taught you uh, how to take that segment, because it's usually not the whole article, but a segment, this is a sequence, or a segment is a compare and contrast, or a segment is cause and effect, or a segment is problem and solution. How might I adjust that, address that? Well, I found three different ways. One, questions that we ask that would uh, show that pattern, or a visual, making a visual of it to illustrate that pattern, or writing in response afterwards to show that. So I took the article, that thrilling article on canoes and showed you how, uh, if you wanted to focus on uh, one of these text structures, how you might do it, okay? So 
I want to focus on topic and details. I could ask you after a paragraph, who or what was the paragraph about? Tell me one or more important thing about the who or what. Oh, basically, that is what paragraph shrinking does. Or I could uh, make a visual of it with you. In fact, we could actually uh, stop. We could make a visual where we had canoes. Uh, after the uh, paragraph on description, we could list the details that it had. Uh, and Native American, uh, they made it from birch bark and dug out logs. So we could create a visual. Uh, or we could write a summary using a writing frame. I love writing frames because the students copy this and complete it, copy this and complete it, copy this and complete it, uh, but they don't start each line over here because it's meant to give you a paragraph summary. Uh, and so this is an example that you can read through yourself uh, of what it would sound like uh, if we taught the students how to use the uh, writing frame as a summary of informational text. Okay, so three ways that this uh, text structure was put into form. Uh, here's another example. Uh, or uh, we have an explanation. Next one, compare and contrast. I could ask questions like, how are blank and blank similar? How are blank and blank different? I could put it in my questions. I could do it visually. Uh, and uh, Loretta, remind me to send these as full pages so that teachers could utilize them, okay? Uh, so how are they the same and how are they different as to their location and materials? This is my favorite actually, but there's other ways we could do it. Or we could have them write afterwards by giving them a writing frame. Uh, and the end result would be looking like this. But you have so many students whose writing is not coherent and this would teach them how to uh, make it much more coherent, particularly through uh, the use of connecting words, transitions like finally. Compare and, and more complex compare and contrast with how they're the same and how they're different. Um, a sequence, what kind of questions could I ask? Uh, how could I show it visually, which we might do for a segment afterwards? Uh, how we might show a sequence uh, and so it goes from questions to visuals uh, and uh, then we could write about it. All right, now, after. So I went through that quickly because you could go back through the examples with your team members in third or fourth grade, particularly uh, the questions could be gone through uh, with K one or two. What might we do afterwards? Basically two biggies. We're either going to have a good discussion about it or we're going to have writing in response to it. Uh, and we've talked about discussions before when we talked about opportunities to respond. Here's a reminder, not just any discussion, we want a discussion that leads to this very high effect size. Uh, so we have to have a well-designed question uh, and we have to give students time to prepare. So if I'm teaching students in second, third, fourth or fifth grade, I will actually have them write down their thoughts, really giving them time to think about it. And because in most discussions in the class, only some students participate, not everybody. I'm going to have them tell their uh, talking points to their partners before the discussion. So even if they didn't enter the discussion, they have already shared their talking points. And then I might even give them some sentence starters, which are in your previous notes. Uh, some rules of conduct, like we're not going to interrupt other people. 
we're going to uh, turn and face them. Uh, and then we are going to have the discussion, which we might have in smaller groups. The biggest thing there is plan it, write down your talking points, and then after you've planned it, share it with your partner. We could also write. Now, if you were to look at the research on comprehension, it would say, have them write a summary, write a summary, write a summary, have them write a summary, write a summary, write a summary, have them write a summary, write a summary, write a summary. And we already saw the kind of writing frames that could be used for a summary. Uh, this one, for example, is a writing frame I've used often with fourth and fifth graders, uh, as well as middle school students to summarize informational texts. Uh, this is one that is short, that was in our last uh, handout. I just want to remind you that it's there. We could have a writing frame for uh, writing, even in second grade, first grade, about a story we've read. We could have a longer one that's based on story grammar. So you could use writing frames for a summary. Or in my research, we taught students this strategy. List, cross out, connect, and number. List, cross out, connect, and number. To write a summary of what they learned, this case about uh, Native American canoes, uh, or, and so uh, we uh, would uh, provide them with this strategy. Now, this is one day I did it after reading an article about the birth of penguins. And uh, the students listed the details they wanted to include in their summary. And then they would go through uh, and cross out anything that they were not going to include, then connect ideas that could go into one meaningful sentence and then they numbered them in the order that they were going to occur in their paragraph. This is a powerful strategy. So list, cross out, connect, and number. List your ideas, cross out ones that are weak ideas, connect ones that could be put in one meaningful sentence, number them, and then write. We have taught this in second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and beyond. And it has proven to be a very powerful strategy for writing a coherent paragraph summary. Now, some of you uh, got the book I recommended on writing, which was uh, The Writing Revolution. And here are two examples of sentence activities uh, from that book. Uh, one was called Sentence Expansion. And the teacher puts on the screen, let's say we read the Native American article the previous day, and we put on uh, the uh, screen the next day, they made canoes. And we write the words who, where, and how. So the students say, okay, they made canoes. Who made the canoes? Well, Native Americans. Where? Uh, across North America. How? from hollowed out logs or birch bark stripped from birch trees. And then they have to put it together into a sentence like this, which would warm the heart of any of our intermediate teachers. Native Americans across North America made canoes from hollowed out logs or birch bark that was stripped from uh, birch, not birth, but birch uh, trees. Uh, and so, when you make a mistake, uh, you should fix it up. I always teach kids, it's okay if you make a mistake as long as you fix it up. Uh, because one day I made a big mistake and the uh, primary students burst out into song and saying to me, it's okay if you make a mistake as long as you fix it up. It's okay if you make a mistake as long as you fix it up. A memorable response, hoping that all of our children would learn that lesson. Uh, so I hope you got some ideas of what you might do. Here's one last one. Uh, 
in the book, The Writing Revolution. They have an, Archer, you're at your 10 minutes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, uh, they uh, had sentences like this that were because, but, and so. And I will tell you, this activity is so much a favorite of teachers and students that many of my schools are repeating it like twice a week. Uh, they use it to go back and review either narrative or informational text. So I might have on the board, after we've read that article, which you read now a number of times, early Native Americans made uh, canoes because early Native Americans made canoes, but early Native Americans made canoes so. So the students would have to copy the sentence stem that only the connectors changed it. Because means you're going to give a reason uh, and but means you're going in a positive direction and you turn around and you go another direction. And so uh, you tell the result. So, uh, but if you have the book at your school, The Writing Revolution, you can find this one because but so in the first chapter. Okay, do you have a piece of paper near you? Uh, and uh, on it, I want you to write at the top, brain drain. And you are going to write for part of this 10 minutes about uh, what we learned about uh, teaching informational text from memory. Uh, and I want you to write down after you've written brain drain, uh, and uh, you're going to write down the word uh, informative text, comprehension, as our title, informative text comprehension. And you're going to write down the word before, during and after. So in your uh, writing, in the brain drain, you are going to write in it uh, what you did before, what you did during, what you did after. Okay, and let me set my clock here. And we are going to, how many minutes do we have left now, Loretta? You have seven. We have seven. So you're going to have uh, four minutes to write. And I am doing this to encourage you to do it in your classrooms because uh, it is one of the uh, practices that are high outcome, low prep. All you need is a title. And it usually is useful to give the students topics uh, if it uh, was something that had different topics they went through. So put your pencil in the air. Uh, and when I say go, you are going to write complete sentences in coherent area. And then you're going to reread it to yourself and to your partner. Getting going, getting going and write.
okay, I would love to walk into your school and see a third grader, fourth grader, or fifth grader um, folder that contained one brain drain, another brain drain, another brain drain uh, of all of the different bodies of knowledge or stories that they read over time. Uh, and you would be able to give them that kind of what's called retrieval practice. They're retrieving the information uh, and uh, they could reread it to themselves and to their partner as other uh, opportunities to review. So uh, now I'm turning this over to my friend Loretta because do we have any questions? It might be on what we do before. It might be what we do after uh, and, uh, or during and what we do after. And do we have any questions that came in the chat box? Nothing posted in the chat. Nothing posted in the chat. Well, raise your hand uh, if you have, and Loretta, you're going to monitor this, if you had a question. Okay, well, then I would say this. Uh, this is a book basically for really major nerds in the area of literacy, because <laughs> it's very, very dense, but has a review of research uh, and then has strategies that you could use. Uh, and some of you uh, in Ohio have been taking the letters training, another excellent way to learn more about comprehension. Uh, this is one of my favorite reviews of research uh, a edited book by David Kilpatrick. Um, another, this is, uh, and, and this is another review of research that David did. Uh, I love Daniel Willingham's uh, book. Um, as a cognitive scientist, he knows not to have cognitive overload. So this is an easy, easy read that's very informative. Uh, an excellent resource guide that's just been updated uh, for our coaches would be excellent, our principals. Uh, and there's the Writing Revolution uh, and a book on why we should teach background knowledge in all of our classes. Well, with that, uh, oh, another vocabulary book. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for giving us your time, for giving us your uh, energy, and my hope is that you will sit down with the PowerPoints uh, and with your colleagues in your grade level and discuss how, th how uh, things are already done in your core program, which ones you could add a little to, which ones you see, oh, I like this one so much I could replace it, uh, but utilizing our best knowledge about comprehension. But always remember, they have to be able to read the words, know the vocabulary, have background knowledge, and have strategies that focus them on critical content. So Loretta, uh, thank you for being our monitor every single time. Is there anything that you'd like to add? No, except that we appreciate you giving your time to us and, and teaching us some of the things that are reminding us of some of the things that we knew in the past. And um, being able to take some new information back to our classroom. Uh, the low prep, high results are fabulous. Absolutely, that's what we want. And you can see that brain drain, how it fit in there. I mean, that is no prep, high outcome. Yes, and the kids uh, initially kind of resisted, but not after they've done it for a while, uh, they, realize that, oh, there's one I did three months ago. That was when we were reading about whales. Let me reread that. Let me read it to my mother. I mean, it was really interesting. They got into it. So uh, Todd, you have been a, a loyal principal each time. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add as we wrap this up? Um, I just count it a privilege, Dr. Archer, that you have taken the time with us. Um, I just made a note, very important, AA videos must be part of Northridge Local Schools induction process. Ah, detail, but wow. I think, again, you have given us a, a resource that we can use to train teachers indefinitely. Um, Thank so, you. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I was thinking earlier, I hope we do this. And then I thought, oh, that's on me to make sure it happens. So I will certainly do my best. You know, our uh, it does take leadership, but it also takes the uh, department sitting down and making some decisions say, oh, I really like that paragraph shrinking. Let's all uh, do that with our informational text. Uh, or uh, the people that are in the primary grades sitting down and saying, you know, that vocabulary instruction that we looked at, let's go through that again and pick out which parts of it we're gonna be certain to employ. So uh, yes, they need your leadership, but all of us can be leaders in getting the highest achievement from our students. All right, well, I wish I'd had more green on today. I could have. I could have had green sweater and red shawl. Uh, but may you have a blessed, very blessed uh, ho holiday season. Uh, may the winds not come your direction. Uh, may just joy and happiness as you're with your family. Uh, but we all need a break, don't we? And we're all going to get a break. Uh, so let us celebrate that we have meaningful work, uh, that we have colleagues that all have the same mission, that we have the collected efficacy that our teaching makes the most difference. Uh, and never to forget uh, the motto that I live by in my teaching, uh, and that is twofold. How well we teach equals how well they learn. And that is an absolute scientifically proven. The quality of our teaching equals their learning. And one day uh, I was at a fourth grade and I remember this so well, I remember where it was. It was in Salinas, California. Uh, and I had just uh, taught in a classroom uh, and uh, I wanted to go out to lunch uh, recess and sort of check out, well, what do they play uh, in Salinas, California? And a fourth grader came running across the field uh, and uh, came up to me. And I said, wow, uh, did you have a question you wanted to ask me? Uh, and the fourth grader said, no, I just know this. If there had been a teaching contest, Dr. Archer, you'd win. And I said, wow, that's the best compliment I've ever had. And I said, why did you say that? And these were his exact words. You teach with passion, you manage with compassion. Now, that is like, a, I was early in my career and got basically the path that we all have to take, that we have to teach with passion and manage with compassion. So bless all of you uh, in Ohio. It was a delight to be with you. And our paths will cross again, probably virtually, uh, but I'll look forward to that. So be well, celebrate, uh, goodbye.